book of 2 Peter chapter 3. So we have today and next week to complete uh, the epistle of 2 Peter. After this, we're going to the epistles of 1 and 2 Thessalonians. Uh, we'll see where we go after that. We may do one more epistle, then after that, either 1 and 2 Thessalonians or maybe one more, then we'll be going to the Gospel of Luke. It's been a while since we've been in the Gospels, and uh, I've been looking through my uh, teaching program over the last uh, 17 years, and uh, it's been a while since we've been in that Gospel, so it's about time we get back to it. So in the book of 2 Peter, chapter 3, verse 1, let's read down through verse 9 this morning and see what the Lord has for us. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water, uh, standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which now exist, are kept in store by the same word, reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Lord, thank you for the reading of your word, and as always, we look to you to be our guide, to be our teacher. We trust that your spirit, who inspired these words, will inspire our teaching today and speak to us as we open our hearts to hear all that you have for us. And we ask you to speak, Lord, for your servants who are listening. In Jesus' name, amen. We just spent the last two sessions looking at chapter 2, which uh, Peter talked to us and warned us about the issue of false prophets and false teachers. And he sort of comes back to that a little bit here as he's talking about those who were scoffers in the last days who would begin to attack the Word of God, who would begin to specifically attack our hope and say, uh, they keep saying, Jesus is coming, but he hasn't come yet. And basically, from what we've seen from history of everything we know from then, whenever then is, till now, they're looking at it saying with human eyes, not eyes of faith, Nothing has changed, and we don't believe the Word of God. We don't think God's Word is trustworthy. And that's the same kind of thing that these false teachers did. They attack the veracity of God's Word. They attack the faith of God's people. And they discourage us from believing God's Word. And Peter is here reminding these challenged and discouraged believers, remember, who are scattered out through the northern region of what is today modern-day Turkey, He's writing to them, and he says here, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. So as he speaks to them, he uses the language of love. He uses a term of endearment to reach out to them, to let them know that even though he's not there, he's hoping and praying that this letter gets circulated and copies are made and sent to these believers scattered all throughout this northern region of, of Turkey. And he's saying, you are dearly beloved, you are close to my heart, and I'm writing to you because I desperately want you to remember, and I want to stir up your pure minds. You see, isn't it true that the world wants to corrupt our minds? 
The world wants to discourage us. It's really gotten to the place for me that I do not turn on the news on the TV anymore. I, I read my news, and even then it's hard enough to not be drawn down into some pit of mire. And I'm not telling you not to watch news. I'm just saying I find it very discouraging. And the world is always against the Lord because the world is under the influence of Satan. Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He is the ruler of this world. So we cannot expect that we're going to find a source of truth or, or encouragement from or through the world in some way. There is nothing out there to be had that is truthful or encouraging by way of what the world has to offer. So Peter, as he's reminding these believers, <clears throat> I'm stirring you up, and he's going to say in just a moment, I'm stirring you up by the word of God. And so we are doing today, and every time we gather and we open God's Word together on Sunday morning, on Wednesday evening, in men's studies and women's studies, or you do it during your devotions, what you are doing is putting yourself under the authority of God's Word. You're putting yourself in a position where God Himself, by His Holy Spirit and by the power of His Word, can stir up your heart and your mind. And He says here, I want to stir up your pure minds. He said earlier at the beginning of his, this epistle in chapter 1, yes, I think it's right as long as I'm in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that I must shortly put off my tent just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. And so he's saying here, stir up, which means to wake up, to fully arouse out of sleep, like an epiphany moment, like a complete realization. I'm sure we've all had those moments. We refer to them sometimes as aha moments, don't we? And what he's saying here is I'm, I want to try to help you to have an aha moment as I'm speaking to you now. I'm reminding you. And we are reminded that we need to be reminded. We need to be reminded of the things of God, don't we? We need to be reminded as, as just as we, you know, we design our service with the psalm reading and all of that to, to stir us up, that God's word might speak to us as the psalm spoke to us this morning, Psalm 27, one of my favorites, you know, seeking the face of God, going into the temple of God, looking for him, looking for his presence. You know, there's not a decision, not a single decision we make that should be outside of the purview of God's will. And hopefully you pray about these things. Hopefully you pray about making large purchases or, uh, you know, making plans to go somewhere and do this or that. You know, James reminds us, you know, we should submit our plans to the Lord before we say, hey, we'll go uh, this or that place today or tomorrow or next year and we'll make a profit and set up a business and do this. He says, no, no, you ought to say if the Lord wills. So he reminds us of that, and certainly we're reminded of our Lord himself on the night as he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was saying, Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what, we, what you will, let that be done. Mary, the mother of Jesus, when she found out that she was pregnant with the Lord, she says, may it be to me according to your word. So that humble attitude of just seeking the Lord. And allowing him to direct our thoughts, to direct our paths. You know, God knows things we don't know, right? He sees the beginning from the end. He is the Alpha and the Omega, we are told all throughout the book of Revelation. And so we need to be reminded of these things. It's too easy sometimes just to kind of, something happens like happened to us. You fall into a mode, okay, where's the doctor? And we start going down this path, but we often don't stop to say, okay, well, Lord, what's going on here? What course of action should I take? Should I listen to what the doctor just said? Or should I get a second opinion? You know, we should be seeking God's will in these things. And so, being stirred up. Now, the opinion sometimes from people, when they are stirred up or when they're reminded of something, and I know this doesn't happen in your family, just saying sometimes happens in mine where somebody says, hey, don't forget, I know, I know. I know Tuesday's trash day. You don't have to tell me to put the trash out. I got it. And then what do you do? You get up Tuesday morning and the trash guys, you can hear them coming down the street and you're like, oh my gosh, I forgot to put the trash out. 
But how many times does it happen in our lives, right? And we, we sort of rebel against that because of our pride, don't we? I don't want somebody telling me what to do. And that's the problem. But that's why we need to be reminded, isn't it? We need to hear it. Somebody, by God's grace, needs to remind us of these things. Hey, did you read your Bible recently? Have you been drawing near to the Lord? What's he speaking to you? Not questions of indictment, but questions of encouragement. You know, hey, what's God been speaking to your heart? Maybe you've been reading, but you haven't really been thinking about, like, what, what's the theme? What's he been speaking to me about through the passages I've been reading? And when that happens, we get stirred up. We get provoked in a positive way. We get reminded of these things. I was reminded recently of uh, seeing a paramedic spring into action. You know, aren't we grateful for those people, police, paramedics, fire, when something happens and they come? And you know what happens? We're in panic, but they come in and their training takes over. But do you know how they got that training? The training was time and repetition, and the repetition is reminder. So don't discount the importance and the weight of reminder. Reminder is good. And Peter here is stirring up their pure minds by way of reminder. Now, the the word pure minds refers to unalloyed, unmixed with the world and its seductive influences. It's the opposite of having a darkened understanding. It means that we're being examined by the heat of the sun's light. And it's akin to the biblical word sincere that we've studied before. The Greek word is sine sire, which means no wax or no impurities mixed with the good. And back in the day, it was referring to those who would make stone busts of people like Caesar or, you know, just statues of important people. And so often, as would happen when you're working with something like stone, you get down to the very end. You're almost done. You got one last little thing, and you got your chisel and your hammer. You're just trying to, like, I'm just trying to, and then the nose falls off. And what would they do at that point rather than go back to the drawing board? They would mix some of the stone dust with the only thing they had in that day because they couldn't run down to the store and get some epoxy or some super glue. And they would mix it with wax. And they would put it on and then, you know, like putty, they would make it the right color and then do it such that, okay, you can't see it. It's good. But they wouldn't allow that, that bust or that sculpture to be out into the sunlight. Why? Because the sun would lose, melt the wax and the nose would fall off. So they would keep the bust back in the shaded area. In other words, they were insincere. Sincere is bringing the bust out into the light and let the sun, the light of day, hit it and see what happens. And so, pure minds, sincere, honest, not mixed with the world. And isn't that one of the greatest problems that we have? Too often, our lives are alloyed or mixed with the world. And since we're in an election season, I've got to tell you that one of the saddest ways that as believers, our minds are alloyed with the world is that we believe the rhetoric we hear on TV. And I'm not here to promote a candidate or anything like that. I'm just saying we need to understand that with politics, at least in the United States, it's always about the party. It's not about the person. We tend to get caught up in that we vote for a person. We vote for people. But we vote for the party. And when you vote for a party, you need to look at what they stand for. And we need to have biblical values. And not fall prey to the world because someone promises something that tickles our ears. We can't vote, honestly, we can't vote based on popularity. We have to vote based on what is true. For or against abortion. For or against uh, financial, fiscal uh, responsibility. Uh, The things that the Word of God takes a stand for. Something that we can talk about more at a later date. But the point is not being alloyed with the world, not being mixed in with the world. We need to allow the Word of God to influence our thinking on everything. 
Spurgeon said, the purest minds need stirring up. It would be a great pity to stir up impure minds. That would only be to do mischief, but pure minds may be stirred as much as you please, and the more, the better. Paul says, writing to the Philippians, I want you to approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. Psalm 24 says, who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has, a clean, who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor has sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Psalm 73, truly God is good to Israel to such as are pure in heart. You see, having our pure hearts and our pure minds stirred up is a good thing. It reminds us of the things of God. Jesus himself said in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So we need to be stirred up. We need to be reminded. We need to, to know that God has his hands upon us. He wants us to think a certain way. He wants us to live a certain way. At the beginning of 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter said, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, we are to live every day with our minds fixed on the fact that we have a hope that's future, that's going to bring to us the grace of the revelation of Jesus Christ, and that we will one day see him face to face, and we are to live for that moment with a singularity of focus. And he says in verse 2, I want you to be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, the Old Testament, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So Peter here is acknowledging, humbly, that the apostles of the Lord have been being used of the Holy Spirit to write Holy Scripture on the par with the Old Testament, with the prophets of old. Notice here, and forgive me if this offends someone, Peter did not declare papal authority here. Because it's not about him. It never was. He says the apostles, of which he's one, God has been using us to write Holy Scripture. Now, you may remember at the end, uh, before Jesus ascended, after he had resurrected, Matthew 28, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. This is... Jesus imparting to them authority to do these things. Paul himself wrote in the book of Ephesians, Therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but now fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, Ephesians 2.20 the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Same thing that Peter's saying right here in his epistle. So what he's saying is this, that the, these epistles, the word that they are writing is the word of God. It's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The same thing that Paul wrote to Timothy saying, holy men of old moved by the Holy Spirit spoke of God. And you see, what they said was 100% accurate because in God's world, in his economy, in the Old Testament especially, a prophet who was 99.9% .9 accurate wasn't mostly right. He was wrong. So a prophet and those whom God is using to write the scriptures had to be 100% accurate. The 99.9% .9 person was a false prophet. And it's the same standard for today. And it must be upheld as the same standard. God's word doesn't change. 
all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Jesus Christ and God our Father, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Knowing this first in verse 3, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts. So a part of his stirring them up and reminding them, reminding them as he just did back in chapter 2, is reminding them that there will be those who will come and who will try to rob you of the truth and rob you of your joy. And these people he calls scoffers. A scoffer is a person who... Uh, th these are words we don't use a whole lot in our language, to jeer, to deride, to mock, to utter severe sarcasm, to taunt, to ridicule with scorn. And we know that scoffers have always existed, haven't they? And especially those who scoff against the Word of God and who scoff against Christianity, which to us is just another way of saying our faith in God himself and in his word. And he said here, you notice, in the last days. People always wonder, when are the last days? I think many would say, they would define the last days as from the time that Jesus ascended into heaven until he comes back for the rapture of his church. And certainly that triggers what we might call the, the very end times, the very last days, the last of the last days. And so we know as we've studied through the book of Revelation here, that when the rapture of the church happens, that is a part of the trigger along with the treaty that the Antichrist writes with Israel. And as he tries to bring world peace for the first time, which is a false world peace, that the time of the tribulation will begin sometime around the, the time of the rapture of the church, that's a seven-year period of time outlined for us in Daniel chapters 9, verses 24 through 27. And then we know what happens during the time of the tribulation. Then there's the first half and the second half of the tribulation. The first half being relatively peaceful, even though God is working and judging, but God is also bringing his prophets and his witnesses and angels and all sorts of people to preach the gospel. But then... When the abomination of desolation takes place, as described by Daniel the prophet, Jesus quotes this in Matthew 24 and 25, then God begins to pour out his wrath upon the earth, and that's the second half of the tribulation. And at the end of that second half of the tribulation, that seven-year period, that's when the second coming of Christ happens, right? The battle of Armageddon, Jesus comes back, all of that. So we are living in that period between the ascension of Jesus and right now the calling home of the church and the saints, which starts the triggering of the time of the tribulation. So we are living in the last days. And I think Peter does this using this term nearly 2,000 years ago to help us understand as future readers that if we're reading this, and the rapture of the church hasn't happened and the tribulation hasn't begun, then this applies to us. This directly applies to us. Scoffers are here. They're here right now. Here are some of the ways the book of Proverbs, just looking at one place, speaks of people who have this heart and this mindset of being scoffers. Proverbs 13, a wise son heeds his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Proverbs 14, a scoffer seeks wisdom and does not find it, but knowledge is easy to him who understands. Proverbs 15, a scoffer does not love one who corrects him, nor will he go to the wise. Psalm, excuse me, Proverbs 19, judgments are prepared for scoffers and beatings for the back of fools. Proverbs 21, a proud and haughty man, scoffer is his name, he acts with arrogant pride. Psalm, excuse me, Psalm. Proverbs 24, the devising of foolishness is sin and the scoffer is an abomination to men. And then finally, Proverbs 29, scoffers set a city aflame, but wise men turn away wrath. 
And so what did Peter say here is the reason for their scoffing? He says they walk according to their own lusts. Again, pride is at the root. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. They only want to do what they want to do. They want things to be such that they can do what they want to do without anyone intervening, without anyone challenging, without anyone saying, hey, that's not okay. You can't do that. How many times have we seen someone caught red-handed, convicted of some heinous crime like a murder? And you watch them sitting in the courtroom on, on TV, and you see that look of defiance. And they're not upset about what they did. They're just upset that they got caught. The reason for their scoffing, he says, they walk according to their lust. The word walk in the New Testament almost always refers to the manner of living, the way of life, their conduct. In other words, they love darkness more than light. One commentator said this, walking according to their own lust, these words remind us that scoffers do not only have an intellectual problem with God and his word, they have a clear moral problem wanting to reject the lordship of Jesus Christ over their lives. One person I was listening to said, we have to understand something, that God measures time, not according to time, but according to morality. And when we think about in the book of Genesis, when God came to the point of having to judge the world through Noah because of the sin of mankind, And how bad it had gotten. Remember, that was a moral issue. It was a moral issue because the whole world was rebelling against God. And then remember, after um, the, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah during Abraham and Lot's time, we talked about some of this last two weeks during uh, looking at the teaching on false teachers. Of course, Peter invoked those examples to help us be reminded and understand that these were things that caused God to have to be moved to judgment. So he judged the world with a flood, which is pretty severe, right? And then he just burned, he just torched two cities to the ground so that all that was left was literally ashes. And so this is the the plight of scoffers. This is what's going to come upon them. They don't want to know the truth. They don't want to hear that there's a judgment. They don't want to hear that there, there is a time when we have to give an account. They just want to, if you will, zen it out and pretend that it doesn't exist. And when someone says it exists, When someone says Jesus Christ is indeed coming back to judge the world, what do they do? They scoff at the promise of his coming. Verse 4, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. You see, if Jesus is coming and if Jesus is bringing judgment, we're not talking about a slap on the wrist. We're talking about judgment with a capital J. Scoffers rob people of their hope in Jesus Christ because sometimes we think the loudest voice is the correct voice, and that's not true. Jesus Christ will come. He will keep his word. And just as Paul told us in the book of Philippians, he said, one day every knee will bow, every tongue will will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, even the atheist. See, because you're an atheist doesn't mean you're right. Because you're an atheist and you pretend that God doesn't exist doesn't mean that it's true. It doesn't mean that you won't be held accountable. When we go back and read Romans chapter 1, so this is some homework for you. Romans 1, Romans 1, 18 through 32. It says in there very clearly, every person will be without excuse before God. And we've talked about that a number of times and we look back at Psalm 19, the heavens are declaring the glory of God and there's no place where their line has not gone out and we refer to that as the general revelation of God. We look at the general revelation and the specific revelation. 
People ask about, what about those people in remote places who have never had someone come and preach the gospel to them? I think God would say, the heavens have declared the glory of God. And we're hearing today so many times, people have written books about this, that people in those closed off countries such as Middle Eastern countries that are so locked down by Islam, that many times God has revealed himself to them in dreams. And praise God for that. That is the grace and the mercy of God, is it not? Revealing himself to people in dreams because we can't get people or Bibles through to them. How amazing is that? For since the fathers fell asleep, they think, oh, nothing's changed. But that's not true. The Old Testament, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all throughout time, God has been revealing himself through the weather, through the prophets, through things that have happened on the earth. God has been at work. God has allowed times of judgment to come because of man's sin. And he's saying here in verse 5, for this they willfully forget, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So what he's saying is this, creation itself speaks of God. How many people deny creation? How many people say, no, no, it's not creation, it's evolution? And think about that. I, I mean, I can tell you because I'm old enough to remember this when I was in, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm dating myself using old terms here, grammar school. That's what we used to call it back in the day right? Elementary school was grammar school. I remember in the early grades, first, second, third grade, we would say the Pledge of Allegiance. We could say God. One of our teachers led us in the Lord's Prayer. And we talked about creation. Then I remember when the time came sometime around fourth or sixth grade, it changed to evolution. The curriculum changed. I remember it. And today, even to this very day, unless you go to a private school or a Christian school that doesn't subscribe to all of that baloney, that this is what's taught, not only in, in our elementary schools, but it's taught in our universities. And the point is this. Peter is making the point that the creation of the earth in verses 5 and 6, by which the world that then existed uh, perished, being flooded with water, going all the way back to that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. What's he talking about? He's talking about Genesis 1, isn't he? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. Then God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the, the waters and let it uh, divide the waters from the waters. And thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And, so, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And so the evening and morning were the second day. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and gathering together the waters, he called seas, and God saw that it was good. What is the point of reading all of that? Because Peter's saying here, they willfully forget that by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, referring to the creation account. The creation account is truth. The creation account is fact. And if you read the creation account, and you read that God created the heavens and the earth, and God created light out of nothing, ex bara, excuse me, a bara out of nothing, ex nihilo. And God did all of these things. God created time. God created days and nights. God created these things. And when people talk about evolution and you read it and you're like, how, you know, chaos theory, how, how, did, how did something that was completely chaotic, and how, then you somehow reason your way to primordial ooze, and out of that 
came order in life. And we have this separation between the animals and humans, but that all just kind of happened over billions of years, and we're just supposed to believe that. There's a rational explanation, and that is that there was a designer, his name was God, and he created the heavens and the earth, and we have the creation account here in the book of Genesis. And when he gets to verse 6 here, by which the, the world that then existed perished being flooded with water, referring to the flood of Noah, and what God, of course, had to do in that situation by bringing judgment. And he's saying here that they willfully ignore these things. These things are there for everyone, not just for those who believe. And he's saying if people willfully ignore that, then that's not a good thing. I'm going to uh, turn back here for a moment. You can turn with me if you want. I referred you earlier to Romans chapter 1. I, I, I want to go there because I think it relates specifically to what we're talking about here. And he said, Romans 1.20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools. And then he goes on. And Peter says, in like manner, they willfully forget. Now, in the Word of God, Colossians 1, here's what it says of Jesus. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him, through Jesus, and for him. And he is before all things... And in him all things consist. That's Colossians 1, 15 through 17. And let me remind you briefly here of John chapter 1. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, capital W, referring to Jesus. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. So when Peter here is saying, hey, they willfully forget, they are suppressing the truth, which is the reason I went back to Romans chapter 1. Peter's point is this, because when they say, hey, everything's continued the way it was from the beginning, that's just not true. Peter's point is, the earth and things have not always continued the way they are now. The earth was different when God first created it. That's why I read Genesis 1 to you. And then it was different again after the flood. Therefore, no one should scoff at God's promise that he will make it different once again, judging it not with water, but with fire. Remember at the end of uh, the account there with Noah in uh, Genesis 6, 7, and 8? Remember what happened? God said, here's the rainbow. The rainbow is a sign that it, I will no longer judge the earth as I did by completely wiping out every person on the face of humanity because of sin, the rainbow is a sign of the covenant that I will not judge with a flood. But as time has gone on, what has God said? Well, it looks like I am going to have to judge with fire instead. Jesus said in Matthew 24, Referring to Noah, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. Until the day that Noah entered the ark, which depending on how you count things was between 100 and 120 years, that no other preacher of righteousness was there building the ark in front of them, preaching to them, and they ignored it, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, and so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Verse 7, But the heavens and the earth 
which are now preserved by the same word, the same word of God, which when spoken created the heavens and the earth. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Peter's saying here, writing Holy Scripture as an apostle, that the time is coming. Yes, God may not judge with a flood, but unfortunately judgment still has to come for those who willfully reject the Lord Jesus. And it will come by fire. But beloved, verse 8, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. And I believe Peter is referring back to Psalm 90, where he said, for a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past, and like a watch in the night. The days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and have compassion on your servants. People like to take this and make something of it in the sense of, well, it's been about 2,000 years since the time of Jesus. So uh, a thousand years as one day, two days have passed. Third day is coming, right? Resurrection. That may be true, but I think the point here is simply this, that God does not reckon time the way that we reckon time. One person said all time is as nothing before him because in the presence, as in the nature of God, all is eternity. Therefore, nothing is long, nothing is short before him. There's no lapse of the ages before God. Time does not impair the purposes of God. How many times have we said things like, oh, I ran out of time. We see God doesn't say that. All things are equally near and present to God's view. The distance of a thousand years before the occurrence of an event is no more to God than would be the interval of a day. With God, indeed, there is neither past, present, nor future. His name is I Am. He is the I Am. I am in the present, I am in the past, and I am in the future. Just as we say of God that He is everywhere, so we may say of Him that He is always. He is everywhere in space. He is everywhere in time. You see, God sees time with a perspective that we do not have. Even the delay of a thousand years may well seem like a day against the backdrop of eternity. Furthermore, God sees time with an intensity that we lack. One day with the Lord is like a thousand years to us. While God works in time, God is not limited By time, for God can accomplish in one day what it would take a man a thousand years to accomplish. So don't forget that God is sovereign. God is over all things. God is not limited by by our space-time continuum, which he created for us. And it says in verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness. It's interesting, that's a word that's not really used much today. When I was growing up, we would say to people, if you were on the job, hey, don't be slacking off. You're not allowed to say that today, by the way. It's taboo. Slack means to delay, to loiter, to be tardy, to be running late, to be goofing off, as we would say, not paying attention. And he's saying the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Just because it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean it's not going to happen. We should not reason from our human perspective that God is late. God is not late. God is never late. He may be rarely early, but he is never late. Early according to our judgment, our estimation. And it says here that he is long-suffering. What does that mean? 
It means that God has incredible, immense patience. I don't know about you, but I find as I get older, I should be getting more patient. I think I'm getting less patient. I don't know why. I've just seen too much stuff. But I pray that God would, would come back. Don't you? I hope you do. And when it says he's not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, it says, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, I don't know when you were saved. I was saved roughly about 1970. That's a long time ago. But if you were saved in the last two years or five years or ten years, aren't you grateful that he hasn't come back yet? Because you've been given the opportunity to hear and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to receive the Lord, to come to the Lord, to repent of your sins. And we're told in the book of Romans in that amazing passage from Romans 9, 10, and 11, which speaks of Israel and how God deals with Israel, he says in that passage, you know, that until the, the fullness or the times of the Gentiles comes in. Jesus also speaks of this. And so there's an implication that some people like to say it this way, that there's maybe a magic number that God has in mind that when the last Gentile is added to God's role, that then he will come. And whether or not that's true, I don't know, but just that general statement, you know, until the fullness or the times of the Gentiles has come in. But when that happens, I believe that is going to trigger what we call the, the rapture. When he comes and he takes home his church, his Gentile, primarily Gentile church, to be in heaven with him. But we see here that God has incredible long-suffering and patience waiting for his plan and his purpose to be accomplished, waiting for people to hear and respond to the gospel. Now, there's the, the two sides of the coin. There's the people who are the, the Calvinists and predeterminism and, and all of that, but there's also the side of man's responsibility. And we find all over the Bible both things described. We find that God has a determinate foreknowledge and counsel, but we also find that God says things like John 3.16, which we like to quote, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so he says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now we know that not all will come to repentance, but you see what the heart of God is that Peter is revealing to us here? God is not willing that any should perish. Paul writing to Timothy says this, uh, I exhort that uh, prayers and supplications and intercessions and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and a peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Sounds like the same thing. In the book of Ezekiel, one of the most significant prophecies against the sin of mankind, Ezekiel says these things, Ezekiel 18, God speaking, Do I have any pleasure that all the wicked should die, says the Lord, and that he should turn uh, from... And that not, and excuse me, and not that he should turn from his ways and live. In other words, he's saying, I don't want people to die in their sin. Ezekiel 18, I'm reading from, just continuing down. Cast away from you all the transgression which you have committed, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore, turn and live. This is God himself preaching the gospel in the Old Testament. Ezekiel 33, 11, Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? This is God's heart. Not 
that people would perish. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And God is long-suffering. And I don't know, but that God has someone in mind here today or listening that he wants you to hear these words. He wants to stir you up and to say, look, why do you keep putting it off? Why do you keep waiting? Turn now. Give your heart to the Lord. Repent. Come to him. Don't be a scoffer. Stop resisting. Don't be like the Apostle Paul before he came to Christ, as Jesus had described to him. Paul, it's hard for you to kick against the goads because that's what you're doing in resisting the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. So Peter here is stirring these believers up, stirring us up, stirring up anyone who will hear the word of the Lord. And today, if you have not yet turned to him, the call of God himself, of his Holy Spirit, of his Son, of his word, and of everything we've been saying here is this, please give your heart to the Lord. Please stop resisting. And you know what? Maybe you're the last one. And maybe the trump's about to sound. So we urge you to please give your heart to the Lord that we might go meet him and be with him. Amen? Lord, we love you this morning. We thank you for your word to us. We thank you for stirring us up. And we ask you, God, to please... For those of us who know you, that we would <clears throat> stop being alloyed with the world and that we would turn to you uh, as believers and purify our lives and seek your face. This is that psalm that we read, Lord, and we are here today to say, along with the psalmist, your face, O Lord, I seek. And for those of us who may not have yet given our hearts to you or come to you, I ask that right now might be that holy moment when they would just surrender and give their heart to you, and stop resisting. I think of the two ladies we've been praying for, Emma and Gina, and I sense that Gina is so close. The first time in a family group text this week, she texted to us that she was praying for us. I've never heard her say those words before. Thank you for what you're doing there, and Lord, the doctors say that Emma shouldn't be alive, that the tumor is pressing on her spine and her head so severely that she shouldn't even be conscious and yet I believe you're keeping her around to hear and hopefully to believe and receive God we pray for her we pray that she would relent she and her husband that they would bend the knee and that they would trust you before it's too late because you said right here you're not willing this is not something you take pleasure in and God we are reminded that you don't send people to hell. We send ourselves by rejecting your goodness and your mercy and your love and your grace. And so may we not be found in that category. May we be found before your throne with our hands lifted high and our hearts wide open saying, I want to love you, Lord, with all of my heart, all of my soul, all of my mind, and all of my strength. May that be our cry to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Shall we stand and worship?